마늘 <laughs> Now that we have your attention. Yes. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> okay, that was like the most epic PowerPoint slide I've ever made in my life. So. Yes, we are geeks and proud. It is all downhill from here. <laughs> yeah. This isn't being recorded or anything. Right, yeah. Right? Like... <laughs> hey, I'm Leif. I'm Daniel. We're talking about strategic planning in kind of a trilogy format. There are three major topics that we're going to cover. There are some things that happened before this, the prequels, if we will, but it wasn't really that good, so we're not going to get into yeah, that. We're going to start, really we'll start around episode four-ish, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to talk about a little bit about the strategic planning process we went through, our, we kind of use on our team mm -hmm. um, at Learning Technology Solutions at Boise State University. Um, and like Leif said, we're going to break it into three main categories here. So the first piece of this we're going to talk about is episode four, yeah. fix it. Yeah. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about what it was like as we got started. Kind of, a, uh, We won't do too much of an origin story for you again. Prequels, not that important. Mm -hmm. But we'll talk a little bit about how we got started there. It's a coming of age story, really, about moving from tactical to strategic. I, I think that's a good yeah. way of putting it. So the first, it. at the tactical level, we had to fix things, yep. right? Yep. So and the second part of this is going to be knowing thyself, right? That's kind of an important part of uh, the strategic planning for us is yeah making sure that we have clarity on our mission and what we're doing and who we're, who we're doing these, this work for. We discovered who our father was. It was, <laughs> it was good. It was good times. It's eye opening. Yeah. <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> we went there, huh? Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the last part of this is going to be talking about empowering the community. And this mm -hmm. is um, a kind of twofold. It's, it's empowering the community within sort of our, our OIT or our IT family, um, as well as empowering the larger campus community as well. Yeah, work with your team, work with your, with your partners and crime, but then also think about the broader community that you're impacting through your decisions. Absolutely. So without further ado, let's, let's jump, jump into in. it. Yeah. So strategic planning and higher ed IT. First of all, who has some experience in strategic planning? Awesome. You guys doing Was, this today on your campus? Or you, is this experience kind of outside of that? A little both? Does, does anybody have strategic planning experience outside of the education sector? or outside of higher ed. Oh, good, mm -hmm. good, great. So, so I think there are some, some key themes that we find anywhere, and then there are some uh, important differences in education that maybe are a little bit unique. Mm -hmm. So tensions between tradition and innovation, you know? So especially, I think, um, when we think about faculty and how they do their jobs, uh, they have pretty much patterns that they like to go through. They're, they're pretty comfortable with, especially when it comes to inter interacting with technology. Um, change can be scary, and so that tradition is really important. So balancing out that need to continue, you know, technology continues to evolve and dealing with that innovation and the tradition. Well, I think you need both, right? So balance is probably a good term. It is. Uh -huh. Between standard and flexible. So. Gotta. Similar to tradition and innovation, there are a lot of standards that we have for good reasons. We think that consistency is important. We think that standardization helps to ensure that we're complying with all of the different kind of regulatory forces that might be at play. Um, but we also want to be flexible for different audiences, especially in higher ed, where there are different departments who have unique needs from from a technology or a research perspective that we want to be able to accommodate. So one size fits most in higher ed, right? Right. And then specifically within higher ed, we talked about this at Northwest Med a couple years ago. There is the, so the university needs to, um, needs to run like a business in some senses. We're mm -hmm. recruiting students. We need to uh, make sure that, uh, that, the, that the trains are running on time, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. But there is also a different culture in academics that has no use for any of that kind of business logic or language that you're using because they are focused primarily on the, the purpose or mission of what they're doing as researchers or educators. Um, but, we, but in order for a university, which is a formal structure by its nature, we need to have the balance of both of those things as well. Right, absolutely. And, and you run into, I mean, I know that uh, 
some of the language we use, right, is we think about strategic planning, we think about um, just planning in general, uh, things like cost-benefit analysis or business cases. These are terms that sometimes rub academics the wrong way uh, as we're going through and, and trying to kind of put these things together. So this is something to be conscious of, not only in how we operate, but also in how we refer to some of the processes we're going through. Yeah, so we're going to tell the story about some of the tools that we use that we think accommodates and maybe helps resolve some of those tensions. Uh, before we dive into that, though, we're going to talk about just sort of our evolution as a, as a unit and how we moved from, like I said, tactical to strategic. Yeah, and it's important to kind of recognize where we started from. That's kind of a, a big part of, of how we went through this process. Yeah. <laughs> so where we started from. Um, these are quotes from a, uh, a present or kind of a report that was generated for our Learning Technology Prioritization Committee. It's a provost committee. Um, it it uh, involved, these statements came from our director of the CTL, yeah. from our CIO. Um, so really kind these, of... These are actual things that actual mucky mucks at Boise State said <laughs> and was recorded. And so this is, it was, it was not necessarily a good place to start from, but it gave us a clear sense of purpose and mission about what we needed to address. Right. Um, as an institution, we've dropped the ball on supporting Blackboard at Boise State. The general campus has absorbed our poor level of support over the years, but they should not have had to do that either. If we cannot put in place a robust Blackboard support structure by spring 2015, we simply recognize as an institution that we do not have the will or capacity to support Blackboard. Those are some pretty bold claims. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they were necessarily completely warranted, but that was <laughs> at least an impression that was, uh, that was shared by certain individuals that had some decision-making authority. So. Yeah. Hence, learning technology solutions <laughs> fix it. <laughs> yeah, that was our primary mission. And we had a clarity of purpose, which was, um, which allowed us to really kind of focus in and make sure that we were doing that. And and that the um, stepping through this process, like this was our first from our first strategic plan. Yeah. This was one of our big, hairy, audacious goals. We're, we're brand new. There's like three of us. <laughs> and like I, looking back at this, we were going through old emails and stuff and trying to to kind of piece together our origin story, story so to speak. And like, I, I'm embarrassed and a little bit depressed that this was a big, hairy, audacious goal of ours, was that faculty and students would report favorable attitudes about Blackboard. Yeah, we Not weird. even you know, like 100% adoption or they sang our praise. Favorable, they didn't hate us. Yeah. That was a big, hairy, audacious yeah. goal. If, we, if they would just not hate us anymore, we'd feel pretty good yeah. about it. So, you know, again, fix it. Fix that it. was our mission. Um, and so a, a big part of that was kind of coming up with what we needed to fix. Mm -hmm. And so part of our, our first um, sort of retreat that we did as a team, we got together in a room and we just started throwing spaghetti at the wall, right? Yeah. Uh, what, what are the things that are broken? What do we need to do? What are the negative perceptions that exist out there? Yeah, we spent a good like, it was a, an entire morning I think that we were just brainstorming like, all right, if we're supposed to fix something, what exactly is it that we're trying to fix? Yeah. How can we articulate the problem? And what are some ways that we might go about addressing it? Mm -hmm. And so that led to, like you said, spaghetti at the wall. It was literally like whiteboards filled with comments and statements mm -hmm. and ideas and stuff that we then tried to refine and encode to some extent and come up with these groupings and categories about, all right, if we're supposed to fix something, uh, it's life cycle management that maybe could use a little TLC. Mm -hmm. uh, the services can be confusing at times because there are different moving parts and different people that faculty need to engage with. And so could we clarify some of those escalation yeah. paths? Um, and then faculty and student training could be improved because it has that similar kind of disjointed uh, phenomenon right. that was happening. Yeah, and it, and it was really just a process of looking at the different things that we had written on the boards and then saying, all right, what are the themes? What are the major themes we can pull out of this to start thinking about how we can start attacking it? Um, because we had to have a plan. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that helped us kind of put together that plan was thinking about each of these different things that we needed to do through a couple of different lenses. What is the impact of student learning? You know, that's a really, it was a key thing from the very beginning is making sure that we always stayed focused on the, you know, our end result or the thing we really needed to be doing was improving student learning. Um, what was it for efficiency? You know, how, where were we spending our time playing whack-a-mole, trying to like just keep our heads above water? Um, and how, how much could we focus on those issues? Shareability and, and sort of acceptance of it. How ready was the university to embrace some of the new processes or tools that we needed to put in place to do this? Uh, not only the university, but but within our OIT family, how, how ready were we and, and did we have the right people in place? I, I like this because the specific items and the rows and the columns are meaningful and important, but I also kind of like the meta-narrative that was starting to emerge here 
where just intuitively we were coming up with multiple metrics that we felt were important to establish a criteria for how we did our work. It wasn't the traditional just like ROI kind of statement that we want lots of adoption or that you know we wanted 100% um, satisfaction. Those were important, but it was this multifaceted kind of lens that we were that we were using to um, try to define what it is that we should be working on. So mm -hmm. that was kind of it was an intuitive thing that that led into other more mature processes that we'll talk about in a set in yeah. a second. And, and so the, the way we use this is you know once we had these things moved from the spaghetti to the categories and the major features within it and then figured out how we were going to evaluate it, we just used like a one, two, three, high, medium, low, right? And then we just sum those. And this helped us get some prioritization. What should we be working on straight away? What's the most important thing that we can do tomorrow to start getting off on the right foot? Yeah. And so from that prioritization, we just kind of wor worked systematically through trying to improve these pieces. Um, so this was a great tool for us to kind of help get all of these ideas that were floating around, make sure that we were staying, moving from general to specific about what we could actually do. And the result of this was a couple of different things. We had to be able to deal with two pieces. We had emerging technologies or emerging things happening on campus that we could not lose sight of. We couldn't just not pay attention to requests that were coming in from people. But we also needed to make sure that we were doing our job and sustaining the different pieces of, of the technology that was already in place. Yeah. And so we kind of put these together. So if you saw Leaf's decision-making slide, this is a slide that um, you saw yesterday probably during his presentation, yep. talking a little about uh, how we introduce new things and how we kind of make sure that we're introducing the right tools. So I'm not going to dwell on that one too much. <laughs> no, it's important because it, it gave us a, some kind of a recourse or a response when we got a, a lot of random requests from people because we were already starting to establish uh, reputation for making some improvements around Blackboard. And so we were getting a lot of random requests from across the institution, anywhere from like Google plugins to entire like categories of video technologies. Like, do you do that too? And we weren't, we weren't quite sure. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so we needed to have some tools and instruments to um, establish scope mm -hmm. and um, define our work. Right, and, and it gave some confidence to the university because we at least we had an intake process, right? It wasn't just like, oh, if you know Leaf, you can call him and then he'll put it on some sort of you know, backlog of things that eventually we'll get to. We had sort of an established uh, intake process that set some expectations well, about how we were going to do that. But it was, you know, but yeah, <laughs> that's kind of how we started. This, this led us kind of tailor that and move it in that direction. From a sustaining perspective, we really had to focus on the Blackboard environment itself. That was our primary purpose, as we were there to fix initially. And so we looked at things like, we have, okay, we have multiple, we're a self-hosted institution for Blackboard. We have multiple environments. None of them match. I'm told they one were, of the largest in the world, too. Like, we're at least in the top three or five. Like, this so, side of the Mississippi, you know? I don't know. <laughs> but um, the you know main things, like, we were introducing new service packs and upgrades. We needed a checklist. I, you know, airline pilots, every time they get inside an airplane, whether or not they've done it a 1,000 times before, run through a checklist to make make sure they've done everything they need to do before they launch or before they take off. We did the same thing for any new introduction to Blackboard. We put together a list of things. We did lessons learned after we went ahead and did a launch to yeah. say what did work, what didn't work, with minute by minute timing on how we do the different tasks during service pack upgrades. And that was an important thing just to make sure we always had a repeatable way of introducing those features. Mm -hmm. We automated a lot of the testing we had. We implemented an ongoing trend analysis where we started watching some of the information around performance. You know, how many, um, what was the page load time right. on our different servers? What were the knowledge base articles that were being used most frequently? So that we could at least have some early warning and detection if there was something that we needed to address. We made a lot of improvements to our knowledge base and just making sure we had more information publicly accessible for the campus. Um, we established kind of the first committee governance pieces and, and set those up in sort of a hierarchy, hier hierarchical way where we had an advisory committee, which is made up of a lot of course coordinators and areas from our uh, distance learning or e-campus center. Um, and then that fed into a, a bigger council, which was largely faculty oriented, mostly, mostly faculty. A bit more oriented. authoritative. Yeah. Right, so. mm -hmm. they, they helped us make decisions. And then we set up, made sure that we set up community communication channels. How are we notifying people about releases that are coming up? How are we making sure they can give us feedback? If they see something, they can say something. Um, and then putting together calendars where people could meet with us for one-on-one -on -one consultations. These last two, these communication channels, the consultations allowed us to get better insight directly from faculty and give them a structured way to deliver it yeah. so that we could continue to add to the pile of things we needed to fix. It's about structure and clarity. That's a good way to right. So uh, again, fixing it meant just kind of getting our act together and, and treating this like the enterprise system that it really needed Absolutely. to be. So um, since we're doing Star Wars team, I thought something from JPL probably isn't too inappropriate here. Um, I had the privilege of attending a, 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 a 
a conference by or a webinar by um, the uh, lead program manager for uh, JPL. Yeah. And they talked about this, the importance of making sure that you are setting aside time to work on operational improvements. Every time we do something new, you know, we always we, we take this great thing, we've got a new uh, piece of software, something we want to roll out to faculty, and we launch it and we go, yay, and now let's hand it off to the, oh crap, we're the guys that got to sustain this thing, right? right? <laughs> so you, you have that, you're always kind of, with every new piece that you do, you're always getting new operational work that you need to sustain on the back end of it afterwards. Well, that's kind of the double-edged sword of, of what I'm sure most of you do is that there's this motivation to try to bring new things to campus and get faculty using new tools, which kind of relates to this previous slide is it's good to have processes and structures for that, but at the end of the day, who needs to support these things? Right. Right. And so anytime you get uh, wide scale adoption of, an, of a new innovation that also increases your own workload. Mm -hmm. And so by focusing on both of these things in parallel, it helps to uh, even out that, that kind of chart so that it isn't just an increase in workload, but you're actually um, operationalizing some of these things so that you can focus on new things without necessarily having to always put out fires. Right. Otherwise, you hit this sort of plateau, whereas you've added these new features or new capabilities, you're always adding the new operational pieces until you hit to a point where you really can't take on new things without adding additional headcount, dropping the ball on something you're already doing. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to need assistance. And so the ability to say, every time we introduce new capacities or new, new capabilities, we also have a portion of our time that we spend every year set aside to operational improvements. What can we do to improve the distribution of administration? so that we're not the only people who can manage or maintain this. What can we do to make our testing process for updates faster? What can we do that reduces our need to host solutions and move it to a place where we can, we can reduce the effort we spend on that? Yeah. So we talked about TechSmith. I know you talked about TechSmith yesterday. Yeah. Moving that to a cloud-hosted solution freed up a lot of administrative time. And, and moving to TechSmith in general away from a hardware video capture solution like we did um, helped us actually reduce the, the need for people to be focused on that on a daily basis, watching encoders and making making sure things happen. And we could take that energy and redirect it to the other initiatives. Yeah, I mean, there isn't a single kind of panacea way to, to do this, but it's a combination of being thoughtful and structured about how you approach these yep. challenges. And kind of always looking for those opportunities to say, what could we be doing better? And how would that help us have more capacity for other, for other items we need to do? Um, this is one of the strategies we use to help us get better understanding and really feel more comfortable with the fact that we couldn't watch every single product 100% of our time. Yeah, the, the immediate sort of feeling when you look at the portfolio of things that you support is that they're all important, and they are. But then when you look at product X and there's only three users and they don't really need your help in supporting it, that isn't equal to an enterprise LMS. And so we had to sort of come up with this structure of like bracketing out things that might be a little bit more peripheral. Not to say that it's not important, but it doesn't require the same level of time and Thanks. attention You've got a meeting, you're late. Yeah, I know, I'm super <laughs> late for that system. <laughs> Where am I going, PowerPoint? Yeah, there's one of them running, there you go. There we go. So there are certain things that we consider our core technologies, which might be enterprise-wide. And we haven't established like a formal criteria for how we determine um, what's core, at least within the realm of learning technologies, because some things are just cloud-hosted and there's five users. We still recognize that in our service mm -hmm. catalog. Um, but, it, but it's not something that we're spending 20 hours a week on. Yeah, we don't train every single person on the team to understand that technology inside and out. You know, we, we like to have sort of this idea of generalizing specialists on the team, right? So everybody has a pretty good, at least faculty level of knowledge on the products that we support, but there are people who are really passionate about certain technologies or because of adoption, we need to have people who are more people who are really deeply familiar with the tools. And we kind of use this model to help us figure that out. So we have more documented on sort of these peripheral pieces that is like, hey, you know, I haven't seen that McGraw-Hill integration be used in a long time, but if we ever needed to, we've got a plan that tells us here's the, here's the contact for it, here's the contact phone number, if something happens with it, this is what you call, and here's our escalation procedure. And that way anybody on the team can pick it up and manage that if we need to, but nobody needs to keep that in the front of their mind. Uh, so that's really helpful. We also have what's called the shelf. And yes. It, and not, not a literal shelf, but it's more of like a metaphorical one. We thought about building a literal and, and shelf. I'll, and I think shelf would be a good acronym. I haven't come up with one yet, but I'm sure if given sure. enough time, I would come yeah. up with So the shelf is if you have a new idea and it's something that you want to spend time on, but it's not really, it's even kind of beyond the outer rung in here, um, but you think it's interesting and maybe has some potential, but you don't have the time or bandwidth, put it on the shelf. Save it for a rainy day. And we'll, we'll document that, that, that it's out there. Um, but it's not something that requires your immediate attention necessarily. 
go ahead and keep talking. I'm good. Oh, should we move on? All right. So as we are, as we're fixing things and we're coming up with these emerging kind of nascent artifacts that describe who we are and what we do, uh, we were reaching a point where we really needed to to better understand like who we are. Like we didn't have. Uh, mission, vision, value statements, all of those kinds of things. And we, we didn't want to do it in a throwaway kind of sense that like, okay, we'll go through the motions and then nobody's going to really read these ever again. We wanted everybody to internalize these things and so we did it as a group and we came up with this. <laughs> this is this is our current mission statement. Um, we started, we've, we went through a couple iterations and talked about this and we started, we had a really long version well, this for is, a while. This is kind of similar to what we arrived at initially because because as we were brainstorming, we had the more traditional kind of corporate-y sounding long mission statement mm -hmm. that was very verbose and like five World paragraphs piece. long and yeah. stuff and had lots of technical language. And we're, uh, we're not gonna memorize this, let alone is anybody else gonna care. So let's have something simple. And so we watched a Guy Kawasaki video where he talks about having <laughs> a mantra instead of a mission. Something that you can remember, like three words long, right? So our original mission was actually the same name as our department. We do learning technology solutions. We fleshed it out a little bit to give kind of a nod to our our campus strategic plan, which is focus on effectiveness. So we focus on the effectiveness of learning technology solutions. Done, right? That's it's simple, do. it's memorable, and it actually does have some meaning to us. Mm -hmm. Um, the vision is a little bit sort of longer. It's we're establishing, we're coordinating. There are more verbs. It describes kind of the actions that we do in order to effectuate this mission. Um, but the values, I think, is probably most important and the ones that we, um, that we refer to and really engender most often as a department. And that's that students come first. Simple, we can all agree, of course, students come for, that's why we're here in higher education. Mm -hmm. Evidence-based and transparent decision-making builds trust. We are, we wear our heart on our sleeves. We talk about, we brainstorm out loud in meetings with other people all the time. So there are no secrets. Yeah. They can never suspect that, oh, what are those LTS guys <laughs> up to? We're totally transparent with anybody who wants to listen. As a matter of fact, we have, we, have, we have a roadmap, and part of our roadmap is what we consider our shadow roadmap, things that we want to work on later on, or maybe the university isn't ready These for. These are the secret covert, yeah. like, future shelf projects. Yeah. And that's just publicly displayed for anybody that wants to, <laughs> to right. see what we're thinking so, about. <laughs> uh, we, we err on the side of transparency. Yeah. And then uh, collaboration with others is paramount to our success. I, this is, you know, if we're working on something for faculty, we need to make sure we're actually working on it with them, you know. Yes. We can't have the, the sort of uh, feeling that we did something to them or even that we did something for them. We need to do it with them, and that's a really important piece of that. Yeah, and flexible yet consistently implemented Universal design improves stability and usability. That's probably the longest sentence that we have out there, but I think it's one of the more important ones. Mm -hmm. Flexibility, like we were talking about earlier, the, the tension between flexibility and consistently. Well, let's kind of straddle that line and see what we can come up with. Mm -hmm. um, and I think universal design gives us uh, at least an orientation towards achieving that. Right, absolutely. All right, so this is another important piece of what we do on a regular basis about knowing ourselves and knowing what's effective. Um, so we, this is the result of looking at all the projects that we had done in the previous year. And we said, okay, those projects, which ones succeeded and which ones failed? Let's be honest, what do we consider a failure? It didn't go out on time, it was canceled, we lost the funding for it, what happened? Um, and then we th figure out why we were this successful or why we failed. And so we're brainstorming through, was it the collaboration that helped us with this? What were the major characteristics, right? Yeah. So did we, did we have room challenges and we couldn't get a room to do a media project that we wanted to do? Yeah. Um, did we have prioritization that came from another area that affected us? So even though we were really gung-ho about it, we were like bottom of the list on, on what needed to get done and we couldn't find the resources or the time to do it. Little shout out to Mark though who's here. CC stands for customer care. You have the perfect win <laughs> loss ratio here of successful yeah. projects. So. Yes, yeah, so we know <laughs> that, and, and that. what we do with this is we look at it and say things like, what are the things that made us highly successful? These areas in the green at the top. Mm -hmm. If we had something that was high priority and recognized as high priority, we could get it done. That's not really probably revolutionary, right? <laughs> I think if, they, if, so, if the leadership wants to get it done, it's helpful, mm -hmm. but we know what, this, is, this was an important piece. If we work with customer care on something and we collaborate with them, Five out of five times that year, we were able to get it done and pull it off and make it make it a success. Mm -hmm. Also, working with collaboration uh, or working with faculty really helped. And then having complete ownership over it uh, of a project was really important for us too. So we knew that if we could control our entire destiny on that um, and we were sort of leading the initiatives, that also made us more successful. Yeah. Other things in here are the sort of the less uh, less uh, successful areas, but. Um, 
having this moment to pause and reflect yeah. helped us say, what can we do to accentuate the things that helped us be successful? How do we reduce the impact of these things? Are there places where we need to reach out and build new connections or, or have um, better interactions? So as we were teams? describing kind of who we were and where we were going, we had to understand where we've been yeah. and what we could learn from that. Yeah. Um, another piece of this is balanced scorecard. I'll let Leaf talk about Anybody this a little bit. familiar with balanced scorecard as a strategic planning method? You heard of that before? So we'll, we'll tell you all about it. That's good. So you, you prepare to learn here. So balanced scorecard, um, it's, it's just that. It's a strategic planning method that includes a series of tools and instruments and ways to think about strategic planning that we really embraced for a variety of reasons. Uh, I'll just kind of I'll read through some highlights of this quote here. Financial measures tell the story of past events, an adequate story for industrial age companies for which investments, long-term capabilities, et cetera. Um, these financial measures are inadequate for guiding and evaluating the journey that information age companies must make to create future value through investment in customers, suppliers, employees, processes, technology, and innovation. So like we saw earlier, when we were just doing this intuitive kind of nascent form of planning and prioritizing, we already recognized, I don't even think we had financial metrics in that mm -hmm. version of it, mm -hmm. but we recognized that there are multiple kinds of perspectives and audiences that we needed to try to accommodate in the work that we did. And so I like what Kaplan and Norton, Norton came up with in, in Balanced Scorecard, that it's customers, suppliers, so the vendors that we work with, uh, the staff, employees, processes, technology, and innovation. It's almost like it was written for a unit like ours doing higher ed IT. Mm -hmm. And so that was probably the most appropriate method that we could apply as we were maturing and wanted more formal kinds of instruments that we could use for our strategic planning process. Right, and so for 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 businesses, this is true. For universities, is, I think it's particularly true. There is no single bottom line, right? You have to balance a lot of different factors as you're, as you're reviewing it. and. We kind of have adapted this. You know, the, the traditional categories that you see for balanced scorecard, um, there's the four categories. Uh, that's like the economic or financial side of it. There's the processes improvement side of it. There's a professional development uh, team side of it, and then sort of a customer side. Yeah, the one the thing that we did that's sort of unique is we took that, we, we followed the model pretty closely, but we had to put our own spin on it. So we took that customer segment, and we broke it into two different categories, students and instructors. And I think that, Obviously, those are different audiences at a college campus. But in the work that we do, we're primarily supporting faculty, faculty development, faculty training, and things like that. Mm -hmm. In our vision value statement, students come first. We know that that's ultimately who we're serving. But kind of by proxy, we're doing that through the faculty support and the tool integration that we're supporting. Yeah. And so we had to think about, and actually, if you're familiar with balanced scorecard, <laughs> It's, there's, um, there's a sort of a flow. So you want to improve your professional development, which improves your operations and system, which helps your customers. And that's where I think it kind of makes good sense from like a linear standpoint. We're improving our customers and instructors who help students who help the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So that flow kind of made sense. So we, we love acronyms. We came up with POIs. We do. Professional development, operations, instructor, student, economic. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's kind of the flow of what we do to improve ourselves, to improve systems, to improve people to ultimately improve the university and beyond. Right, so what does this look like? Well, it's a map, right? So- um, Take your time, so <laughs> there's, there's a lot of boxes on here, but the idea is that in each one of these categories we've identified particular goals, things that we wanna work on to, um, to try and improve this. So as we're thinking about what projects we take on in a given year, we look at this map and say, which does these apply? Which is it affecting? Um, and the bottom line, and honestly, if we're finding things that are not mapping well to what we're doing, then we can, we have that gut check to say, is this the right thing that we should be working on? But again, yeah. pay attention to the flow too, and don't try to track every line here because you're gonna get dizzy. But they used to just, be colored and it was crazy. <laughs> but uh, note that each of the arrows are pointing up. So it's like we establish who we are, staff development, professional development, establishing uh, this baseline of skill sets and expertise, continual improvement there so that uh, what we do and the tools that we support and how we support them also gets improved which in turn leads to increased tool adoption, satisfaction, support satisfaction, user communities, et cetera, from instructors, which helps students potentially increase grade satisfaction, completion of learning outcomes that reduce costs, and increases persistence and retention, all those other kinds of facts. So there's a flow, there's this linearity to uh, all of the work that we do, which we hope has this kind of positive output on different audiences across mm -hmm. campus. Absolutely. So um, balanced scorecard, though, it's, it is something that should be considered, you should do it iteratively. It's one of these things where if you dive in, and this is a 
like lessons learned from lots of people who came before us. Let me back, not to cut you off, but let me back up a little okay. bit. So these are all goals, right? right? And goals are good, but how do we know our, we're meeting our goals? Right. What does success look like? And that's kind of where this, these measures come in, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to measure the effect. How, how well are we achieving these pieces? And that's what really Balanced Scorecard is about. That final piece is having a scorecard that says, these are our goals, and this is what we have set. You know, we want to be able to move this needle this much in the future. You know, we're kind of heading in that direction. So what do we know what good is? What's a good level of faculty adoption? What's a good level of student satisfaction? You know, setting those goals for ourselves and then being able to track our progress towards those goals is where we need to go. Yeah. And right now at Boise State, we've done, a lot of, we've done a lot of work on our team about this. We've got sort of outcomes. We figured out we know what our goals are. We've identified the measures that we want to look at, um, at with just in a recent kind of session. Um, and what we're doing right now is building that scorecard. Yeah, this is kind of where we're together. at today. This is currently a work in progress. Right. But uh, yeah, if maybe you, next year's Northwest Met will tell you how it went. Right. I mean, the key thing to remember here is that it's, it is a powerful tool. And as a powerful tool, you have to be careful about how you apply it. And so kind of uh, to illustrate this point. <laughs> be careful with your tools. Yes. Your father wanted you to have this when you were old enough. This is the weapon of a Jedi knight. Not as clumsy or random as a blast name. An elegant weapon. A more civilized age. <laughs> That's one of the deleted scenes. You can't, you can't get any more classic than the cat noise, dude. Yeah. <laughs> so, really, what? Oh, Hold on. Sorry, there we go. So, uh, you know, the, what we're illustrating there is if you, uh, it will lead to immense frustration if you try and jump directly into doing your measurements first thing. And one of the biggest things is how many of, uh, we all have different applications on our campus and at this point in time in learning technology and you know, everything, it, everything is data driven, right? We all want to see analytics and all the vendors are selling their analytics. They will give you numbers for everything. Mm -hmm. But which numbers are important? Yeah. Which ones should you be looking at? And which ones are just noise that you need to get rid of and focus in on the ones that are really important? And that's what that strategy map does is tell you which ones you should be looking at. Don't just at. go diving into the data lake without like a canoe or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, avoid, you know, you need to build, when you build an assessment around measures you have available. Instead of building metrics around concepts you need to measure, you have a classic case of the tail wagging the dog. And this is from uh, a Joel Zimmerman who's talking a little bit about using balanced scorecard in nonprofit organizations. Well, I like to think that the journey that we went through um, kind of worked well because we, had, we established some of that discipline and maturity um, to think about our goals and what's important to measure rather than just what's easy to collect and measure and then try to turn that into goals. That would be backwards, right? Right, that would, that would be trouble. So here's an example of kind of how, when we, when we started working through what should we be measuring, you can see some tiebacks in here, and this is, you know, we're doing this in a session, so it's, not everything is like really well illustrated. If I was, right, I, I'd have made these more clear, but stable and reliable infrastructure is one of our goals from an operational perspective. Satisfaction is one of the things from an instructor and student perspective. Training and knowledge managers operations. This utilization really comes into the adoption pieces of it. Yeah. And so we're thinking about each of these different goal areas, and then how, what are the available metrics that we have? How are we going to demonstrate or illustrate uh, these pieces? You know, how are we going to measure this? But, but leading with these goal statements, so these are reflections of the strategy map that you saw earlier. Right. And then what things can we, what are, what's available, or what do we need to build in order to measure whether or not there is success in those different areas. And I, you know, and it may not be a surprise, but I definitely look at a lot of the uh, information that's available from some of these systems and go, this is junk. It doesn't actually tie back to where we, what we need to measure or what we're interested in improving. Um, and being able to just say, I don't need to focus my attention and time on that. That is a very liberating <laughs> and, and good thing as well. All right, are we ready for chapter six, episode six? Episode six. Yes, any questions so far? All right, we're All right. rounding the final lap here. All right. So. Empowering the community. Empowering the community. So here, you know, we, I, those two screenshots you saw before about us talking about the different pieces on air, this is actually the session where that took place, right? So we... We, we don't do things in a vacuum. We no. do things as a team. It isn't, it isn't just like, 
Lee for Daniel just telling everybody what they need to do, we include people in that process. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this is uh, most of the staff from our department. We got together in a conference room. We talked about goals and metrics. This is the previous screenshot that you just saw as it's being created uh, uh, together where we mutually kind of construct what we think is important and how we're gonna measure it and what we think is feasible and what we're comfortable with as a team. Mm -hmm. So empowering the community has a couple of meanings. We're empowering the local community of our department to be included in the strategic planning process, but we're also including others. So what we haven't done yet, but we intend to do, and this came up in this discussion, mm -hmm. is okay, we, our department thinks that these are important and meaningful metrics of our goals. Do our stakeholders care? Mm -hmm. Do our faculty and students and those customers that we've identified, how can we get their feedback on whether or not these are meaningful metrics? And so that's gonna be the next step. Mm -hmm. We're gonna put together a prototype or a proof of concept, and then we're gonna bounce it off of these different committees and other channels that we have for getting feedback from our customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and you know, it's very important. I think one of the biggest things that's helpful for this, if I just told Brad, Brad, you got to go in and I want you to pull the utilization numbers for TechSmith every week and then put those in a place where I can access them. This is something that is tedious. He doesn't want to do it. Maybe particularly he's got other things that are important. Maybe I can let it slip this week. When we go through this conversation and we have this, everybody understands why we're doing it. Everybody has that clarity of purpose and mission on why this is an important number and what we're, what we're actually using this number to do. Well, and Brad probably owns that metric because he came up with it, yeah. wrote it on the, the whiteboard or whatever mm -hmm. we used to collect. And so, yeah, that's, that was my idea. Now I'm going to follow through with it. And so mm -hmm. that's empowering people at an individual level too. Absolutely. So the other thing we do is how we get our projects actually in to our queue. So every fall, we go through a sort of a strategic planning summit. Um, this last year, uh, one of the things that we did, which is really fantastic, is we actually did pitches for each of our ideas. So yeah. every person on the team came up with a list of things that they thought we should be working on in the next year based on the feedback they had received from faculty, based on what they knew in the products or what was coming out in the different products. And we wrote down... 30 second elevator pitch, yep. sell it to us, get it, convince us that this is the top thing that we should be focusing on in this next year. Yep. So we locked ourselves in a room off site for a day and then we went through these elevator pitches, and then we all kind of ranked and voted and had some criteria that we used to establish what we felt as a team was most important. And then we followed through that with a round of SWOT analysis. Everyone's familiar with strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, so that we had further refinement on the practicality and feasibility. The cool thing about the SWOT, I don't know if that's the next, we do, yeah. if that's the next slide here. It is, here. yeah. Yeah, so this is, um, you see we have our own sort of internal uh, like code Going back to the strategy map that we saw earlier, you remember that big with the Admiral Akbar? So that um, each of the letters and numbers on here represents like an O2 is the second goal under that operational swim lane. Uh -huh. So we have internalized the strategic planning artifacts that we've created as a team that it's not just something you put in a folder somewhere and forget about, but we actually apply it as we go through these cycles or iterations of strategic planning. Mm -hmm. So now we all kind of know for the, this shorthand for what our goals are, and we, put, we map those onto the SWOT. So now mm -hmm. we've got, oh yeah, O2 is gonna be a weakness, uh, but S4 student, like that might be something that's pretty compelling, and so mm -hmm. we just kind of plot those in there. So we have this internal sort of language that's meaningful to us as we go through these steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it means that as we're going through and thinking about these things, we're all, it's always staying connected. It's not a disjointed process. Um, and so moving from like basically our, our version of Shark Tank, right, where we got up and everybody their pitches and we came up with the ideas and we picked the top 10 that we actually carried that's forward. That's right, we allocated like investment money in each yes. of the... Yes, <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so it was, it was kind of entertaining, it was fun. Um, it was a nice, it was kind of, it was lighter. People, you know, Leaf came up and gave a really impassioned story about a student that he totally made up on the spot, I, but it was I great. I splashed water on, yeah. under my eyes, so it's like, <laughs> you know, consider so it, it was, it was a part, you know, you gotta sell it. You, if yeah. we can't get bought into it as a team, how are we gonna sell it to the rest of the university? Um, that how this are we is gonna care thing? about it on a day-to-day on a day -to -day basis if it's not meaningful and, and we feel that there's this sense of purpose in the work yeah. that we're doing? If it's just kind of going through the motions, then things tend to get dropped. Right. If it's, I'm doing this because of that student that like brought me to tears because of her story. Mm -hmm. That's going to motivate you to get the work done. Right. And, and also the buy-in here. I mean, when you see your ideas go all the way up and this is in the top 10 now and we're going to carry that project forward, there's a sense of ownership and pride in making sure that that gets done well in the next coming year. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a lot of, as we put these on here, of course, there's a lot of like, you sunk my battleship conversation going on. Um, as <laughs> their O2s, O6s. Yeah. Um, but it, it was fun. This actually was a really good event. And we did this in, a, in about a day. Um, we had the ability to look back, pause, and reflect, 
to do our presentations, uh, 30 second presentations and pitches, prioritize, uh, highlight the work that we want to do in the next year, and then do a SWOT analysis to say what are those key pieces that are going to um, kind of carry these forward? What do we need to be aware of? So this was the other thing that happened that day. Well, we were talking about uh, professional development. And so as a key component of um, our sort of structure for, for strategic planning is we also mapped people's interest levels in the different topics that we use. We used our, we have uh, something called a job description questionnaire, which is our HR document that describes the duties and functions of each of our positions. So we surveyed all of our staff and we had them talk about, based on the duties and functions in their, in their uh, job description, mapped to those core technologies that you saw earlier that yeah. was part of our portfolio of things that we support. What are you interested in? Uh, what do you want to improve your kind of skills and, in, and uh, your expertise in? Uh, and then we turned that into, uh, we, we, we turned it into graphics that demonstrated uh, where we're at and where we're going. And we looked for kind of trends about, boy, we're really heavy in this area. There's not so much over here. Let's talk about that. So as a group, we had an understanding about um, are all of these kind of formal documents and artifacts that we're producing along the way, are they an accurate representation of, a re of reality? Mm -hmm. uh, and if not, what do we need to do to correct for that? Yeah, and I think we found things like, you know, everybody felt like it was their job to manage particular technologies. And we're like, well, actually is more than what we thought we, you know, we proposed are sort of our core and our recognize and our partner sort of strategies. Some of those technologies were being overserved. Um, I don't think we had any that were being underserved, but we, I think the sense of ownership is strong within our team, right? <laughs> so um, we just kind of had to say, okay, well, is that the appropriate use of our time? Is there a better way that we could be doing that? What would that free up if we focused on these things a little bit differently? And again, that's the foundation. What we do in terms of professional development influences all of those other kind of channels mm -hmm. that flow from, from there. Yeah. Actually. When I said this has also happened that day, I actually wasn't referring. I was just saying you were playing a tiny invisible keyboard. It, <laughs> That's what I was talking about. So, but uh, yeah, I guess we did the other thing too. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, piano solo. Yeah. <laughs> so why do we do those kind of things? Yeah. So to kind of wrap it all up in terms of like valuing the people and the work that we do, um, I think that based on some kind of general psychology theories, this is a co-opted model of flow theory. If you're familiar with that. Um, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, I think I said that right. Don't ask me to spell it. I can say it, but I can't <laughs> spell it. Uh, he's a positive psychologist that came up with this idea that there's a balance between your, your skill and your ability. That if it's high in one or the other area, that you're probably going to be bored. But if, if they're just right, that if you're being challenged and you have the right level of skill, that you're going to enter the state of flow, which is the ideal work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I always like to keep that in mind and make sure that our skill and our interest and expertise is the right kind of balance or match so that people are enjoying and right. being productive in the work that they do. Right. So there's the, there's, here's the flow, kind of the uh, x-axis here. But then I also think that motivation is another thing that could be correlated with that. People are either motivated um, by extrinsic rewards that they want recognition or compensation or things like that, or they're motivated by intrinsic motivators, uh, like a sense of purpose or meaning that the work that they do has value. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's an either or kind of thing. I'd like to be right in the middle in all four of those quadrants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then sort of uh, wrapping that up, we talk about empower. So far, we talked a lot about empowering. Who's our, our community? Team. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's our campus. And then it's, it's our, our city and our region, and it's the university should be a hub of a lot of different things. We're growing potential employers. We're a hub for culture and innovation. So I think that that's our real community, and, our, and like indirectly at sort of the highest level of abstraction, that's who we're, that's who we're serving mm -hmm. at the end of the day, right? Mm -hmm. And so the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, I think, does have an impact and matters for all of the other people out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and through having a clarity, you know, a kind of making sure that operationally we've got a good rhythm for managing the things that we just need to do to keep the lights on, right? That first step of sort of just fixing it <laughs> um, that we needed to do to get the operational stuff out of the way so we could focus on the other pieces. That's a critical component. Mm -hmm. that, that cadence just has to work. Then the second piece, right, knowing ourselves, making sure we had that mission and vision and the clarity on what we were doing mm -hmm. um, and having a mechanism for us to align, uh, align the work that we do to these goals um, as well as uh, kind of making sure that keeping track or checking the numbers, are we doing what we said we would do? Yeah. 
and then and the last part at of the this. end of the day we're people you know yeah. so it, you know by its nature the work that we do is a social endeavor and so mm -hmm. we need to try to find feedback uh, at multiple levels to make right. sure that what we're doing is aligned with what people want yeah so that's that that's that that's it that's what we got for you guys today thank you <laughs> <laughs> Uh, any questions? Yeah. Um, some of the programs uh, at Boise State, I know, use Google or maybe other platforms. Mm -hmm. you, guys, you guys are strictly, do you, do you support the Google application, or is it kind of depending on the different yeah. programs they kind of do their own? There are, there are a few cases where, and that's sort of that like standard versus flexible. Sure. There are a few cases where if you have your own budget and resources, um, certainly they, they can go ahead and use their tools. We have talked about um, how some of the things that we do in terms of like ensuring reliability and getting feedback from different stakeholders could add benefit for, you're talking about ed tech, yeah. right? Could add benefit to them. And they've, you know, they've thought about it, but uh, uh, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. They trust the students, I'm just saying. Oh. I'm not a but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Send it to us in writing. Send it to them, and yeah. then we'll we'll see where it goes. That's my only about so that's a good. But I like I like what you said though. Is is student feedback has actually given us a quite a bit of traction in trying to move certain priorities forward because mm -hmm. that that people across campus listen to student opinions, right. and so the more that students feel empowered to voice that and express it through different kind of channels, we'll absolutely latch onto that because that's what we're here to serve. Right. Good questions. All right. Thank you guys so much for your time.